Ready? Ready. Now? Soon. Do the scientists really know? Will it happen today? Will it? Look! Look! See for yourself! <laughs> Welcome to Frankenstein Tea! <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Today we're going to uh, read All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. Frankenstein Tea is a, a short story program, so that's appropriate. Yeah, it's yeah. also a library podcast where we give updates, and we'll do some of those at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but I, we've been talking about this <laughs> and thinking about Ray Bradbury here. We, we, we Actually, we mentioned this last week. Yeah, well, that yeah, eclipse. Yeah, yeah. It's haunting. It is. It is. So this is a short story that we're going to read and share with you today called All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. And the, this was from 1954, right? 1954. Came yep. out in a magazine. You can't, uh, yes, and we looked that up, and I can't quite do it. Some some fantasy magazine. A fantasy yeah. sci-fi magazine, yeah. yes. Yes. So, so it's not quite copyright permissible. But it's almost 75 years, and um, you know, hopefully it's in fair use um, because... You know, this is a library program. We're not making any money off of this. This is not monetized. <laughs> this is mon not monetized. Not monetized. It, um, it's just, um, it, it's a fun story because it's a, sort of like a reverse eclipse yeah. in the story. Yeah. 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 It's, it's haunted me for many years. Um, and it's been haunting me during this whole eclipse buildup. Yes. So, the, so, so we're going to share it. Um, it's not monetized. No, no. Uh, but we are librarians, and that's what we do. Absolutely. So we, we, we share literature with you, and uh, hopefully it will be thought-provoking and also get you a little excited for the eclipse. So uh, oh, shall you, we? You think people aren't excited? <laughs> Jeepers. They're like, people are like renting their homes. And, I know. You know, bringing in visitors and... I think I'm going to be sleeping here on a cot. There you go. I don't know if I'll get home you, you that know, night. You won't be the first director to do that. Oh, really? <laughs> Snowstorms from Snowstorms? Long story. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Actually, you know what? To both of your predecessors... Yeah, well, so here's, is that why there's, Long pillow, is that why there's pillows and blankets in this room? Oh, boy. Oh, being, boy. being a director is a lifestyle, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. For sure. For sure. Um, okay. Ready? Ready. Now? Soon. Do the scientists really know? Will that happen today? Will it? Look, look, see for yourself. The children press to each other like so many roses, so many weeds intermixed, peering out for a look at the hidden sun. It rained. It had been raining for seven years. Thousands upon thousands of days, compounded, compounded and filled from one end to the other with rain, with a drum and gush of water, with a sweet crystal fall of showers and the concussion of storms so heavy they were tidal waves come over the islands. A thousand forests had been crushed under the rain and grown up a thousand times to be crushed again. And this was the way of life. This was the way life was forever on the planet Venus. And this was the schoolroom of the children, of the rocket men and women who had come to the reigning world to set up civilization and live out their lives. It's stopping, it's stopping. Yes, yes. Margot stood apart from them, from these children who could never remember a time when there wasn't rain and rain and rain. They were all nine years old and if there had been a day seven years ago when the sun came out for an hour and showed its face to the stunned world, they could not recall. Sometimes at night she heard them stir in remembrance, and she knew they were dreaming and remembering gold, or a yellow crayon, or a coin large enough to buy the world with. She knew they thought they remembered a warmness, like a blushing in the face, in the body, in the arms and legs, and trembling hands. But then they always awoke to the tatting drum, the endless shaking down of clear bead necklaces upon the roof, the walk, the gardens, the forests, and their dreams were gone. All day yesterday they had read in class about the sun, about how like a lemon it was and how hot, and they had written small stories or essays or poems about it. I think the sun is a flower that blooms for just one hour. 
That was Margot's poem, read in a quiet voice in the still classroom while the rain was falling outside. Ah, uh, you didn't write that, protested one of the boys. I did, said Margot. I did. William, said the teacher. But that was yesterday. Now the rain was slackening, and the children were crushed in the great thick windows. Where's the teacher? She'll be back. She'd better hurry. We'll miss it. They turned on themselves like a feverish wheel, all tumbling spokes. Margot stood alone. She was a very frail girl who looked as if she had been lost in the rain for years, and the rain had washed out the blue from her eyes and the red from her mouth and the yellow from her hair. She was an old photograph, dusted from an album, whitened away, and if she spoke at all, her voice would be a ghost. Now she stood, separate, staring at the rain and the loud, wet world beyond the huge glass. What are you looking at? said William. Margot said nothing. Speak when you're spoken to. He gave her a shove, but she did not move. Rather, she let herself be moved only by him and nothing else. They edged away from her. They would not look at her. She felt them go away. And this was because she would play no games with them in the echoing tunnels of the underground city. If they tagged her and ran, she stood blinking after them and did not follow. When the class sang songs about happiness and life and games, her lips barely moved. Only when they sang about the sun in the summer did her lips move as she watched the drenched windows. And then, of course, the biggest crime of all was that she had come here only five years ago from Earth. And she remembered the sun, and the way the sun was and the sky was when she was four in Ohio. And they, they had been on Venus all their lives. And they had only, they had been only two years old when the last, when last the sun came out and had long since forgotten the color and heat of it and the way it really was. But Margot remembered. It's like a penny, she said once, eyes closed. No, it's not, the children cried. It's like a fire, she said, in the stove. You're lying, you don't remember, cried the children. But she remembered and stood quietly apart from all of them and watched the patterning windows. And once, a month ago, she had refused to shower in the school shower rooms, had clutched her hands to her ears and over her head, screaming the water mustn't touch her head. So after that, dimly, dimly, she sensed it. She was different, and they knew her difference and kept away. There was talk that her father and mother were taking her back to Earth next year. It seemed vital to her that they do so though it would mean the loss of thousands of dollars to her family. And so the children hated her for all these reasons of big and little consequence. They hated her pale snow face, her waiting silence, her thinness, and her possible future. Get away! The boy gave her another push. What are you waiting for? Then, for the first time, she turned and looked at him. And what she was waiting for was in her eyes. Well, don't wait around here, cried the boy savagely. You won't see nothing. Her lips moved. Nothing, he cried. It was all a joke, wasn't it? He turned to the other children. Nothing's happening today, is it? They all blinked at him and then, understanding, laughed and shook their heads. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> oh, but, Margo whispered, her eyes helpless. But this is the day the scientists predict that they, they know the sun. All a joke, said the boy, and seized her roughly. Hey, everyone, let's put her in the closet before the teacher comes. No, said Margot, falling back. They searched about her, caught her up and bore her, protesting and then pleading and then crying back into a tunnel, a room, a closet, where they slammed and locked the door. They stood looking at the door and saw it tremble from her beating and throwing herself against it. They heard her muffled cries. Then, smiling, they, they turned and went out and back down the tunnel. Just as the teacher arrived, Ready, children? She glanced at her watch. Yes, said everyone. Are we all here? Yes. The rain slacked still more. They crowded to the huge door. The rain stopped. 
It was as if, in the midst of a film concerning an avalanche, a tornado, a hurricane, a volcanic eruption, something had, first, gone wrong with the sound apparatus, thus muffling and finally cutting off all noise, all of the blasts and repercussions and thunders, and then, second, rip the film from the projector and inserted in its place a beautiful tropical slide which did not move or tremor. The world ground to a standstill. The silence was so immense and unbelievable that you felt your ears had been stuffed or you had lost your hearing altogether. The children put their hands to their ears. They stood apart. The door slid back, and the smell of the silent, waiting world came into them. The sun came out. It was the color of flaming bronze, and it was very large, and the sky around it was a blazing blue tile color, and the jungle burned with sunlight as the children, released from their spell, rushed out, yelling into the springtime. Now don't go too far, called the teacher after them. You've only got two hours, you know. You wouldn't want to get caught out. But they were running and turning, their faces up to the sky, and feeling the sun on their cheeks like a warm iron. They were taking off their jackets and letting the sun burn their arms. Oh, it's much better than the sun lamps, isn't it? Much, much better. They stopped running and stood in the great jungle that covered Venus, that grew and never stopped growing, tumultuously, even as they watched it. It was a nest of octopi, clustering up great arms of flesh-like weed, wavering, flowering in this brief spring. It was the color of rubbish, rubber, and ash, this jungle, from the many years without sun. It was the color of stones and white cheeses and ink, and it was the color of the moon. The children lay out laughing on the jungle mattress and heard it sigh and squeak under them, resilient and alive. They ran among the trees. They slipped and fell. They pushed each other. They played hide and seek and tag. But most of all, they squinted at the sun until the tears ran down their faces. They put their hands up to that yellowness and that blazing blueness and they breathed out of the fresh, fresh air and listened and listened to the silence which suspended them in a blessed sea of no sound and no motion. They looked at everything and savored everything. Then, wildly, like animals escaped from their caves, they ran and round, ran in shouting circles. They ran for an hour and did not stop running. And then... In the midst of their running, one of the girls wailed. Everyone stopped. The girl, standing in the open, held out her hand. Oh, look! Look! she said, trembling. They came slowly to look at her opening palm. In the center of it, cupped and huge, was a single raindrop. She began to cry, looking at it. They glanced quietly at the sun. Oh! Oh! A few cold drops fell on their noses and their cheeks and their mouths. The sun faded behind a stir of mist. A wind blew cold around them. They turned and started to walk back toward the underground house, their hands at their sides, their smiles vanishing away. A boom of thunder startled them, and like leaves before a new hurricane, they tumbled upon each other and ran. Lightning struck ten miles away, five miles away, a mile, a half mile. The dark darkened, the sky darkened into midnight in a flash. They stood in the doorway of the underground for a moment until it was raining hard. Then they closed the door and heard the gigantic sound of the rain falling in tons and avalanches everywhere and forever. Will it be seven more years? Yes, seven. Then one of them gave a little cry. Margot! What? She's still in the closet where we locked her. Margot. They stood as if someone had driven them, like so many stakes, into the floor. They looked at each other and then looked away. They glanced out at the world that was raining now, and raining, and raining steadily. 
They could not meet each other's glances. Their faces were solemn and pale. They looked at their hands and feet, their faces down. Margot. One of the girls said, well, no one moved. Go on, whispered the girl. They walked slowly down the hall in the sound of cold rain. They turned through the doorway to the room in the sound of the storm and thunder, lightning on their faces, blue and terrible. They walked over to the closet door slowly and stood by it. Behind the closet door was only silence. They unlocked the door even more slowly and let Margo out. And that is how it ends. All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. All Summer in a Day, yeah. 1954. Yeah, and I... 54, 1954. Yeah, and I, I can't believe that's how it ends. <laughs> like, he leaves it completely up to your imagination. What happens next? So he asked me that. <laughs> I, I printed this off. And, uh, and we had to double check that. <laughs> right. Is there, is there another that, ending? That there's a lot of, uh, of um, you know, internet chatter about, about that, that. Yeah. yeah so so that is how it ends but but you i think you made the comment um they unlocked the door even more slowly and let Margot out so she's alive she's alive yeah but we, we don't know what state she's in no you no know? no or if she's ever able to forgive them a- as good literature leaves you often absolutely <laughs> what, state, what state am i in now <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> oh so and it, Gosh, that does actually sometimes feel like winter and spring in Vermont. You know, winter, with all the, with all the rain. <laughs> eclipse. <laughs> That's right, the eclipse. Yeah, yeah, by not having the sun for so long here in Vermont. Bu- know, so. Bullying children. Bull- well, hopefully we don't have that many bullying Jeez. children. And please, please do not lock anyone in the closet during the eclipse. Mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No locking in the closet. <laughs> Probably ever. He, he not lock people in the closet. He's so good, though. Like the... Ray Bradbury just, it, it calls to be read out loud, doesn't oh, it? Well, so I was thinking that. So I, I read this a long time ago, read it this afternoon, you read it this afternoon, yeah. and then we read it out loud. Yes. And, and, and while we were reading, I was thinking, we're going to have to day, have a day on Frankenstein Tea where we encourage everybody to go read aloud to someone. Something, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, reading aloud is really... <laughs> But when you have a, such a great writer like this, you know, the alliteration comes through mm. and the poetry of his, just yeah. his, his prose is just amazing, you yeah. know? Yeah. And sometimes that doesn't come through when you're just reading it silently. Yeah. It's not until you actually speak out loud. Yeah. Read it out loud. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Well thanks, done. Thanks everybody yeah. for listening. So, uh, you know, we kind of just got right into it. We thought we'd have fun with those first few lines. I think we told you this is Frankenstein tea. We really are drinking tea. Yes. This is a library podcast from... From the Aldridge Public Library. Ian and I do this weekly. I'm Kristen. I'm the director. I'm uh, Ian Gothier. I'm the children's librarian here. We had a big week. <laughs> we had a very big week. We had the uh, the writing contest. You packed the house. And it, you know it was funny because they actually they were writing poems about you know the, what they thought the sun looked like, yeah. and that immediately I thought of our writing contest. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And I thought you know that writing contest. Uh, so they got their awards last night. for yep. The, yep. the winners. Um, and then the winners read their pieces. Yes. And that room was packed. Yeah, we had probably and, uh, about 80 people. Oh, definitely. At, at least. I say at there. least, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and what, a, what, a, what a really powerful component that is for kids to read in front of a crowd. Yeah. Like such a good skill, such good practice. Yeah. Um, all of that is just so important, I think, for learning, educational outcomes, development, all of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so, and I knew they were going to read out loud, but it didn't really hit me till we were, oh, we need more chairs. Yeah, <laughs> we need yeah. more chairs in front, more cha-, you know. And, and those I kids did a great kids job. Did a, yeah, they, they did a really great, great job. job. And yeah. it, you know, it, you can tell it takes it takes a lot of courage and gumption to get up in front of that many people and you know re- well, I, read I a heard, piece. I heard a small story from a teacher at the oh, end. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and she said the the student was not going to do it. Couldn't do it. Wasn't even going to come. And she said, "Come, I'll read your piece." And so the student came. And the teacher said, I'll read your piece, sit down, enjoy the program. And she said halfway through, the student gave her a thumbs up, and she got up and read her piece. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. 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 So, good job. 
Well, well yeah. thank, thank you. Good job to the kids. Yeah, congratulations yeah, they, they, they to were them the show. and their families. Yeah. Right? That doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm-mm. Nope, that does not happen And the in teachers a vacuum. as well. Yeah, the teachers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that was great. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic event. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to another one next year. So uh, I will. Yeah, yeah, will. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, hopefully. Hopefully everyone will um, consider writing for our writing contest next year, yeah. next next spring. Yeah. And so that was, I think, like event two or three of our Vermont Reads um, Vermont Humanities program. Yes. And we have uh, our last program coming up uh, this Thursday at 5.30. We have Rick Winston coming to the Aldrich. Um, he wrote a book called Red Scare in the Green Mountains. Uh, it's the McCarthy era. Um, it has a little bit of a subtitle there. The themes of the Vermont Reads book are echoed in his book. And so he'll be doing a slideshow presentation. Um, and I hope people come to that. I, yeah. I, I know that he's always a crowd pleaser. He is um, indeed. And he's not doing a film. Right? <laughs> but but he did. I will tell you that um, he did say he would consider returning with a film series. Ooh, so, oh, so, fantastic. So I will work on that. But for now, he's coming Thursday at 530 uh, for Red, Squ- Red Scare in the Green Mountains. Mm. Free and everyone is welcome. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Um, and then we have lots of events coming up. You're going to talk about a few, but I just wanted to plug that the, the newsletter did go out today. It's filled with events, um, and we'll keep returning to give you updates. And um, uh, But for this week, for, on my end, it's, it's really about uh, Red Scare and the Green Mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk and talk about uh, Red Scare and McCarthyism, right? Like mm. the, the the crowds there, mm-hmm. like the peer pressure and everything yeah. in that story. <laughs> yeah, really, right? It's, We're it's, always, it's, it's always hunting. tying us in, right? 1954. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I think that's... Oh, I, 1950. I didn't I even th- make the connection. No, me 1954. Yeah. But I think that's the subtitle of Rick's book. I think uh, that he puts that in as a year. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm. Synergy Con- around here, Connection right? made. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What, but, else, what do you have going on? So, well, the big thing, of course, is the eclipse. Mm-hmm. That's the next big thing. So that will be Monday, April 8th. April 8th, yes. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be having our eclipse party here um, starting, I believe, at 2 o'clock. And uh, come on by. We, we probably will have limited a limited quantity of glasses by that point. Left. So, left, yes. Right. So um, if you need uh, glasses, make sure that you fill out our res- reservation form which is on our website, aldrichpubliclibrary.org, um, and fill out that reservation form and come and pick up your glasses. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have the glasses, some glasses here. We'll also be um, showing a live broadcast of um, NASA's live stream of the event, of the eclipse, um, on our projector on the big screen. So even if it is a rainy day, and there's, there's always a high probability so in the that chance. That that could happen, you know. Um, even if it's a rainy day, you'll be able to watch it and enjoy it. Um, we'll also be making those cereal box um, projectors, pinhole projectors that I showed you last week um, with the kids. So if you want to do that, bring a cereal box and we'll have uh, the other materials that you'll need. Tape and aluminum foil, push pin, pretty basic stuff. So um, we'll be doing that. Um, we'll talk in a little bit about um, solar science and uh, yeah, having a good time. Yeah, having a good time. I like because there's other events going on in in uh, in the city, right? Yeah. There's yeah. there's events going on in Barry um, about the eclipse. Um, I like that we're bringing the kids in and yeah. the families in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and even if you're not a kid, you, you'll still enjoy our event. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll definitely be talking about solar safety as well. Yeah. So that, that's going to be a big thing. You know? Yeah. And so. I did a plug uh, on, on Frankenstein Tea last week, and I did it at the Friends meeting this week. Um, you know, it's, it's a really good time and opportunity if you're an adult to volunteer with us. Yeah. We're going to need some people helping us direct traffic. It should be very crowded downtown. If it is raining, we may be the only indoor event. So, you know, uh, we, we could use some hands and some people uh, letting people know where what's happening here and where to go. Um, so think about that and get in touch with us if you have a little bit of time to volunteer on that day. We could probably save you a pair of glasses if you wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, that's good payment. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just realized that. So we'll, we will save you a pair of glasses if you choose to volunteer with us. Yep. Um, 
Uh, what else are we doing today? Is that about it for today? I think that's about it. But yeah, we we we, wanna... we, wanna do, we always do a little mental health check in. Mental health check in, yeah. And so, um, well, have you seen the sun today? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you locked in a closet? Um, uh, sure well, feels well, like it sometimes. Yeah, definitely up here. Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, on a serious note, we, we believe in no stigma, no shame. We are in uh, an institution in this community where we offer information and education and uh, community. And so uh, if you're having uh, mental health uh, trauma or situation or not able to function properly, um, perhaps there's something we have for you here. But um, what we really encourage you to do is to take care of yourself. Um, check in with your family, your doctors, uh, uh, your friends. Um, get outside because today is an outside day. It's a beautiful um, day. We're, we're coming through it. We're all coming through this together. And, um, and so we offer no stigma, no shame, and um, please take care of yourselves. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 And read, and read, read, read a, read a good <laughs> read. short story, read a good and book. Read. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next week on Frankenstein Tea. Stay safe and, and keep, keep reading. reading. <laughs>